managed by our students, where they network with leading scientists around the world and invite them to talk about their work. These talks are hosted live and we also stream them on our YouTube channel. You can catch the session there. The typical format is about 45 minutes for the talk, followed by a Q&A session and some interaction with the speaker. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Madeleine Lancaster from the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology UK. Thank you so much, Dr. Madeleine, for accepting our invite and agreeing to talk to us today. To start this session off, let me invite Dr. Pavitra Chavali to introduce our speaker today and initiate the session. Pavitra? Yeah. Hi, everyone. And hi, Madeline. So um, I'm not going to take a lot of time since most of the audience here is really familiar with uh, Madeline's work from MRC LMB. So Madeline received her PhD from University of California, San Diego, she, where she worked with Joseph Gleason. And then she joined Jorgen Noblich Lab at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology in Vienna, Austria. So it is here that the lucky accident and the equally diligent follow-up led her to pioneer um, in the field of cerebral organoids. So colloquially, it's called as mini brains. And she has been routinely using this powerful platform to unravel the mysteries of human brain. And I'm sure that she's going to talk to us more about it now. Over to you, Madeline. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Pavitra. Um, I will share my screen now and hopefully everybody can see this. Okay. Um, actually, just one second. I need to minimize this so I can see my own slides. There we go. Okay. So it's really a great pleasure to be able to tell you about the work in my lab today um, as part of this seminar series. Um, so in my lab, we're interested in um, the human brain. We're interested in, in what features of the, the, the developing an adult human brain uh, give us our superior um, cognitive capabilities. And we're interested in this question, not just because it's a very interesting question, but also because, um, because it has important implications for human disease. Um, and actually, it, it turns out that um, disorders that affect the brain, so mental illnesses and other neurological disorders, affect a very large number of, of people in the population. So in the UK, these are UK numbers, but um, there are uh, about one in four people every year that will be diagnosed with a mental illness. So really quite high numbers. And yet despite this um, high prevalence, um, mental health um, uh, disease doesn't, uh, doesn't receive as much funding as a lot of other um, areas of, of, of biology, like for example, um, cancer. Um, and one of the reasons why um, we're also interested in this is because we, we like to obviously understand more about uh, normal brain function, how defects in brain function then, of course, would, would lead to these types of conditions, um, and, and ultimately in an effort to come up with some better uh, treatments. Um, and actually, when it comes to uh, uh, mental health and neurological disorders, the treatments are pretty pretty sad, actually. So they're, uh, for many of the um, uh, mental disorders that, that people often think of, like schizophrenia, for example, um, patients are still taking drugs that are decades old, and we haven't really had any new drugs in a very long time. And that's because of um, major drop-offs um, at the clinical trial stage. So this has been called the clinical trial cliff. Um, which is particularly prevalent in drugs tar targeting the central nervous system. So there's been actually quite a lot of drugs that have shown success in, in animal models, drugs that have even been able to, to, to reverse spinal cord injury, for example, in mice. Um, and yet once they make it to the clinical trials, they fail miserably, either because of, um, because of lack of efficacy or because of toxicity. I think this is because the human brain is so unique. It's, it's really what sets us apart, uh, you know, compared to, for example, some of the other uh, organs of our body. And so we are interested in, in, like I say, in those human specific features. And one of the most striking uh, features of our brain is that it's very large. So it's um, uh, much larger than commonly used uh, animal models like mice. And it's even uh, much larger, uh, you know, when you take into account body size, because obviously as 
you know, as an animal's body size increases, its brain does as well. But you can actually take that into account and come up with this number, this so-called encephalization quotient, which basically um, puts it into perspective. Uh, and, and, and what this number means is that um, our brain is about seven times larger than it should be for the body size that we have. Now, other apes also have large brains uh, for their body size. Um, gorilla, for example, has a larger than expected brain for its body size, but you can see it's much lower than this, than this seven uh, fold number. Uh, whereas mice, for example, actually have a smaller brain than you would expect for their body size. Um, and so uh, this increase in brain size comes down to cellular makeup and, you know, neurons being the key computational um, units of the brain, we tend to, to focus on neuronal numbers. And so the human brain has around 80 to 100 billion neurons, whereas, you know, a mouse has less than 100 million neurons. Um, and so this, this number is really, um, is really big. It's actually really difficult, I think, to, to wrap our heads around, you know, billions. And so one way I like to think about this is if you took those 80 to 100 billion neurons and then you spread them out over the nine months of gestation, that would require um, uh, 12 to 15 million neurons being produced every hour in order to achieve those numbers. So we're talking about really huge numbers here, um, really kind of mind boggling. And, and so we're interested in, in how the, those neurons are being made, because at the end of the day, we want to understand, um, you know, how the human brain gets to be so large. Um, and so in particular, we're very interested in human specific uh, brain enlargement. And so that means really comparing to our closest uh, relatives. And so, uh, like I say, comparing to uh, apes, uh, uh, gorillas and chimpanzees. And um, I'm showing here on the right a couple of coronal uh, sections through um, adult, human and chimpanzee brain. And you can see that the human brain is about three times larger than a chimpanzee brain. And so, uh, again, we're interested in, in where the size difference comes from. Now, in order to understand where the size difference comes from, we need to understand uh, developmental aspects, because obviously this enlargement is happening during development. So before I get into exactly how we do that, I want to just give a brief background on human brain development, just to make sure we're all sort of on the same page on that. So um, the, the human brain uh, starts as an epithelium. So it's, a, it's called the neuroepithelium, it's a neural tube. And like all epithelia, it has, uh, you know, it's composed of polarized epithelial cells within, with a fluid filled lumen on the inside, um, apical on the inside, basal pol uh, uh, polarized components on the outside. And um, this, this, this tissue um, expands over time and particularly the most rostral uh, portion of the brain will expand and really kind of balloon out in humans. And that is then what, what will become the cerebral cortex of, of our brains. And so if you were to zoom in on the wall of the cerebral cortex here, what you'd see is a cytoarchitecture that looks something like this, where you have, like I say, you have these neuroepithelial cells to start with, which are polarized, um, touching both the apical and basal sides. And they're dividing symmetrically and kind of just expanding their numbers to start with. And then at a certain point in development, they switch and they start um, dividing asymmetrically now and generating more differentiated daughter cells, um, which include neurons, but also intermediate uh, progenitor types, which can themselves um, divide and produce more neurons. And so at this stage, these, st these, these stem cells are now called radioglial stem cells. Um, but they still do have some of this polarity, so they still have a contact to the apical surface uh, down below. I'm drawing apical down and basal up here. And, and they have a contact to the outer surface of the brain as well. And the neurons actually use the, the basal process of these stem cells as a guide to migrate out and position themselves um, out in this um, cortical plate, which will become the gray matter of the brain. And the, the, the cortical plate has various layers and the positioning of neurons within those layers, um, along with their molecular identity, helps determine their projection patterns so that the more superficial layer neurons project within the cortex, uh, many of which actually cross uh, the hemispheres across the corpus callosum. And deeper layer neurons project out of the cortex to other brain regions, for example, the spinal cord. 
And so what you end up with is this beautiful uh, human brain connectome. And of course, the, the way that these neurons connect with each other um, and they're, they're this, the architecture of this is very important. Um, and there are stereotypic patterns here that are the same from person to person. And that's really important. It, it can't just be a random connection of neurons. It has to be uh, organized. And that organization can really be traced back to uh, these early stages in development and the very early uh, setting up of tissue architecture. And so in order to model this, we want to try to model that tissue architecture as closely as possible. And, 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 and as I say, we're interested in uh, human specific features. So we need a human model. And obviously we can't do experiments on, on actual you know, human brains. And so we turn to an in vitro model. And so um, if we take the, the images I just showed you starting from the neural tube and you actually go back in development even further, you go all the way back to the very early blastocyst. And these are the stages that we are trying to model in a dish in order to set up the blueprint for this neural tube and allow the formation of these um, cortical tissues. So what I developed as a postdoc um, are these cerebral organoids or brain organoids, which start from pluripotent stem cells, which are uh, essentially similar to these inner cell mass uh, cells of the blastocyst. So these cells might be actual embryonic stem cells taken from the inner cell mass of human embryos or induced pluripotent stem cells, which are um, reprogrammed from adult uh, cells. In any case, these pluripotent stem cells can produce uh, various different uh, germ layer identities or different, different organ types. Um, just like the actual inner cell mass cells of a blastocyst, they can give rise to any organ in the body. Um, and so what we do is we essentially uh, trigger their development. We, we set them off on a path towards development uh, by making these what are called embryoid bodies. And these are basically just aggregates of these cells that spontaneously start to differentiate, start to form the different germ layer identities. Now there are not as organized as an actual embryo, but the, the cells have really a remarkable uh, capability of following intrinsic developmental programs. And they actually can form then an organized um, neuroectoderm around the outside. So this is uh, equivalent to the, um, the neural plate of the developing embryo, which in vivo in the embryo, this neural plate will actually then sort of fold up and then close and form this um, fully enclosed neural tube. And what we do in, in vitro then is we take these neuroectodermal tissues, we then put them in a, in a gel, an extracellular matrix gel called matrogel, which triggers them to form this neural tube-like uh, structure. And you can actually see these here where you ac we actually have these fluid-filled uh, cavities, just like the lumen of a neural tube. We then put these tissues um, in an uh, agitation culture, so this can be a uh, spinning a bioreactor or an orbital shaker in order to get more fluid movement and better oxygen and nutrient exchange so that they end up to, uh, getting to be quite large. Um, more recently, we've uh, improved these protocols. We've uh, started including a bit of bioengineering to help more reproducibly generate uh, neural tissue um, along with other improvements in media formulation and what we end up with is very reliable production of these organoids with these large lobes coming off of them. So we've injected here a dye so that you can actually see this flu these fluid filled cavities uh, within these lobes. And so each, one, each of these lobes is essentially equivalent to uh, a cortical uh, hemisphere essentially. So exactly what you're seeing uh, in this in vivo image. So it's, it's disorganized in the sense that there are many of these, whereas obviously in vivo, you would have one telencephalic vesicle, which would split into the two cerebral hemispheres. Here we have several of these vesicles, which are developing into uh, cerebral uh, cortex. Um, but we can zoom in and so well, we can section them and we can then focus in on each one of these lobes. And we can see that they, like I say, they have this, these, these, um, these open vent, uh, spaces very similar to ventricles in the brain, surrounded by dense layers of, of neural stem cells and neurons. And so each one of these little lobes is quite similar actually to the developing uh, uh, embryonic cortex. And as I say, they can be quite large, some, some of them even as large as a mouse developing cortex. Um, 
And we've also um, improved Saito architecture. We're now able to generate um, a very nice, um, not only progenitor zone layers, so these ventricular zone and, and subventricular zone layers, but also get an intermediate zone and a, and a cortical plate with, with the align, with neurons aligning very nicely within that. Okay, and so um, recently we've also um, uh, furthered these technologies even further. So um, work from Stefano Giandomenico, who was a very talented PhD student in my lab, um, showed that we could get a really nice long range connectivity in these tissues uh, when we culture them at the air liquid interface to improve neuronal uh, uh, maturation and survival. And uh, when we do this, we get these really beautiful, very thick bundles that projects from, you know, within these cortical lobes and project over to, you know, long range, several millimeters uh, to other regions of the organoid. And we can even, uh, we can even show that some of these tracts uh, seem to actually leave the organoids and we could um, uh, provide a target. So here we're, we're uh, uh, placing a, a mouse spinal cord um, with attached uh, uh, muscle explant next to the organoid. And we can actually see these nice tracts coming from the organoid and innervating the mouse tissue. And so what we're modeling here is something similar to the corticospinal tract. So these would be neurons coming from the motor cortex and projecting down into the spinal cord and would be able to trigger um, muscle contractions in vivo. And we were able to show that in these in vitro um, co-cultures, we could also see uh, a trigger of muscle contractions when we stimulate the, the human um, organoid. So that uh, seems to show that we can not only get very nice um, neuronal projections similar to what you see in vivo, but that we can also get functional output. Um, now, Laura Pellegrini very recently, uh, um, she's a postdoc in the lab, uh, we uh, very recently published a paper showing that we could also generate organoids that have cerebral spinal fluid. So these are uh, what are called choroid plexus uh, tissues. And so these model the part of the brain uh, that actually generates the CSF uh, within the brain. And she was able to show that they produce these very large fluid filled sacs. Uh, and actually when we um, extracted the fluid from these, we found that uh, proteomically they were highly similar to actual in vivo CSF. And on top of that, they, they form a barrier that protects that internal CSF like fluid from the outside uh, uh, media in a very similar fashion to the type of barrier that protects the uh, brain and CSF from the blood. And so we could also look at permeability of different compounds and show that they showed they had a very similar uh, drug permeability to what is shown um, in vivo. Um, now, I want, what I really wanted to uh, spend time talking about is more of our unpublished work, or we have a, actually, this is work that's, um, that's on bioarchive, so it's, it's not, it's sort of unpublished, I guess. Anyway, um, but I, I wanted to cover some of that newer stuff. So one of the things that we uh, uh, did with these um, choroid plexus organoids very recently was actually to look at their expression pattern and, and try to use them along with our brain organoids to try to understand more about the current uh, COVID-19 situation. So the reason we got interested in this is because of increasing reports of neurological um, complications in COVID-19. So in fact, it's actually quite a large number of patients and these even mild cases um, describe CNS manifestations. So headache is actually really, really common, but uh, there's also uh, an increasing um, prevalence of of uh, fatigue, long-term fatigue, things like brain fog that people are experiencing. Um, and there's this, this sort of new description of something called long COVID where people are, are um, dealing with COVID symptoms for even months after they've already had it. And these symptoms are often um, uh, things very similar to, to, for example, chronic fatigue syndrome um, and, and uh, include a, a, an array of different neurological symptoms. And so um, it's not really known how much of these symptoms might be directly um, caused by the virus and how much might be indirect. So for example, you know, strokes are probably down to defects in the, in the vascular system uh, within the brain. But for example, this, this brain fog uh, uh, is less, less well understood and the fatigue as well. So we just wanted to first kind of use our data. We have quite a bit of single cell RNA-seq data just to see if, uh, if we could um, look at the receptor for this, uh, for the virus. 
So we looked at um, some single cell RNA-seq data from brain organoids, which include both um, neurons and neural progenitors, as well as choroid plexus type cells. And what we found actually was that the receptor ACE2 is highest in choroid plexus. So in the, in the choroid, this, this mature and immature choroid plexus epithelial compartments, as well as in the stromal cells of the choroid plexus, but it was pretty much absent in neurons and neural progenitors. And this um, uh, cofactor, so this protease that's involved in viral entry, this temporis 2, also seemed to be present in the choroid plexus, and particularly in the choroid plexus epithelial cells. So we looked at in vivo data from the Allen Brain Atlas and found that indeed this receptor is highest in the choroid plexus, um, higher than any other brain region. So that seems to match what, what is seen in vivo. And so we wanted to look a little bit more carefully at what specific cell types are expressing ACE2. So we took these choroid plexus uh, um, cells and then re-clustered them to look and see where exactly the ACE2 is expressed. And when we do a reclustering like this, uh, basically a subclustering, what we find is actually two new populations, um, including a, a very small population of neural crest uh, derivatives, but also these lipoprotein producing uh, cells. Now, these are cells that seem to be, you know, bona fide choroid plexus cells, but they seem to also express a lot of, um, of um, uh, lipoprotein type. So like a lot of apolipoproteins. So ApoA1, for example, uh, shown here. And these are the cells that express the ACE2 and the uh, cofactors. We then um, tried to look and see what other uh, um, you know, genes are, are co-expressed with ACE2 um, in these choroid plexus organoids. And what we found is that actually the highest, the, the, the co-expressed genes are again a lot, you know, in these um, lipoprotein uh, type pathways, but also other viral receptors are, are seen in these cells, including other receptors for other coronaviruses. So that suggests that maybe these cells are um, susceptible to the virus. Um, and so we just wanted to test that. So the first thing we actually tested was uh, using a pseudotyped uh, lentivirus carrying the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. And when we put that on choroid plexus organoids, we found that it uh, very readily uh, infected choroid plexus uh, cells. Um, and, and this is quantified here compared with a positive control, uh, a positive um, virus carrying uh, the VZ, VSVG uh, glycoprotein and a negative that has no envelope glycoprotein. And uh, when we looked uh, at ACE2 staining, we found that the cells that were infected with this uh, pseudovirus also expressed um, ACE2. Now we also did this on cortical organoids. These are actually our air liquid interface cultures, which have um, plenty of nice, healthy, mature neurons. And we did not see any infection of these. Um, and that is in really stark contrast to our positive control as VSVG. So that suggests it doesn't seem, this virus doesn't, or at least the spike protein doesn't seem to have very much tropism for neurons, but have tropism for choroid plexus epithelial cells. We then turn to live virus because we, there have been reports showing that it might infect neurons at least to some degree. And we thought, well, maybe the reason we're not seeing much of an infection of our neurons is because we're using a pseudotype virus and not live virus. So we then turned to working with live SARS-CoV-2 and we saw again, a very robust infection of choroid plexus cells here marked by HR2C, but no infection of the uh, neuronal compartment. So these are mixed organoids containing both choroid plexus cells and neuronal uh, cells. And the neurons here marked by HUCD. We didn't see any staining uh, for the spike protein in those cells. And we also could show that in choroid plexus organoids, the virus was not only in, you know, infecting these cells, but it was actually also being um, uh, replicating and, produ and being produced and secreted into the media. Um, and again, we tried uh, uh, other things with, um, with live virus on cortical tissues. So we also tried experiments on just sort of pure cortical organoid tissues uh, in order to make sure there wasn't any choroid plexus that could be, I don't know, you know, selectively taking up the virus, but we still didn't see infection. Um, I'm not showing it here, but we could, we could see one or two cells if we increased the amount of the live virus, but we had to increase it at least tenfold. So that suggests that it just that this virus might, if there's really huge amounts, might be able to infect a few neurons, but it clearly doesn't have a very strong uh, uh, tropism for neurons, 
whereas it does seem to readily infect choroid plexus cells. And we think that's again coming down to these lipid producing cells because we found that um, the, the infected cells also express these apolipoproteins um, and those are not present in, uh, in neurons. So we think it's, it's a specific tropism for these types of cells that also express high amounts of ACE2. Um, we then want to see what is the effect of that? So, so what, is, what does that mean you know, in terms of the physiology? Um, when, uh, if this virus were to infect the, the choroid plexus in vivo, what would that do? So we uh, looked at actually the, um, the type junctions here. So this is Claudin-5, it's a marker of these cell-cell junctions. And what we found is that after infection, the cell-cell junctions were just completely broken down. And so we're still doing some more work on this, but what our current model is, is that this virus probably doesn't really uh, cause the neurological symptoms directly through, an, uh, through a direct effect on neurons, but it could very well break down this important barrier. And of course, if you have systemic inflammation going on and you've got lots of cytokines and, and other inflammatory signals and immune cells, um, traveling around, you know, in your, in, in your blood system, then these would suddenly be able to leak through and get into the brain and cause pretty dramatic neuroinflammation. And I think that's also, um, fits very nicely with, uh, the types of, um, uh, of, uh, um, symptoms these patients have, because the symptoms do have a lot of overlap with chronic fatigue syndrome, where also it's thought to involve uh, a neuroinflammation uh, going on there. So, okay, so I, that's sort of where we are with our SARS-CoV-2 story at the moment. Um, I'm going to now totally switch gears and go back to the big question that I raised at the very beginning, which is really kind of the main focus of my lab in the long, in the long term. So the way we've been approaching this is by generating brain organoids from different species um, and comparing them. And of course, we're not the first ones to think that this might be an interesting question. And so there have been actually uh, several papers now coming out where they've been looking at brain organoids made from different species. But all of the studies look, uh, that have done this so far have looked at stages after the onset of neurogenesis. So after neurons are already being made, and many of these studies are focusing more on transcriptomic changes and looking at you know, expression differences between these different, uh, different species. But I think we, don't, we still don't actually have an explanation you know, a mechanistic explanation for why the human brain is actually bigger than um, other uh, primates. And so to get at that, we wanted to come at this from more of a cell biological and developmental perspective and try to understand um, how, you know, look at tissue architecture and see how that blueprint might already be different in humans compared with um, other apes. So this is work done by uh, Silvia Benito, who's a very talented PhD student in the lab. And so what she's been doing is generating organoids from uh, human and other non-human ape primates, um, non other non-human apes. Um, and she's uh, been able to um, optimize these protocols and make sure that we're using the exact same protocol for all of the different species um, and that they are highly comparable. And we're able to generate organoids that look very, very similar between the different species. But one thing that she noticed right off the bat was that um, while they looked very similar in terms of their architecture, Sure. the overall size of these organoids seem to be slightly smaller in the non-human apes. So we got very interested in, in that size difference, of course, because that's really what we're interested in. So we decided to go and try to find out when the size difference first starts. So if we go back to the very beginning of this protocol, what we find is that during neural induction, so this is very early on, we don't see a difference between the human and the non-human apes. But once they've formed these, um, these neuroepithelial telencephalic vesicle tissues, so these, these, these buds that are coming out, we, then we start to see, that's when we first start to see a, an overall size difference. So we started looking at that, looking at, um, the, looking at these buds uh, and basically looking at their architecture. And so this is uh, staining for ZO1, which marks the apical surface. And then uh, you can see SOX2 marking the neural stem cells, these neuroepithelial cells. And what we found is that um, when the size difference uh, is present, we already see that um, the, these neural tube-like buds uh, seem to be larger um, in the human than the gorilla or the chimp. And they, they seem to have a, lar uh, a longer sort of um, apical surface. So Sylvia um, teamed up with a mathematician and came up with an approach to actually trace out these apical lumens and quantify them. And we found that, yeah, indeed, the human uh, organoids 
um, these, the, these telencephalic vesicles show a larger apical surface area compared with non-human apes. Um, so we then wanted to figure out, you know, what's, what is responsible for this difference in, in size of these um, apical lumens. And going back to our, our understanding of development, you know, we know that the cerebral cortex really balloons out and that this apical lumen, this ventricle really expands dramatically. Um, but what is responsible for that expansion? So if we look back again at our, you know, understanding of the cytoarchitecture there, we know that neuroepithelial cells early on are expanding symmetrically, and then they switch to this asymmetric division. And so what this would mean for the tissue is that during the symmetric proliferation, these cells are expanding, or the tissue is expanding the tangential to an asymmetric division mode. Now they're no longer expanding tangentially, and instead the wall of the cortex starts to thicken, and so it, this, this is an expansion in the radial dimension. Um, and so this switch could be very key to, this, uh, to these differences. So the most likely explanation for the, and maybe they're already making neurons. So we thought, let's look and see whether they've already switched to making neurons. And when we looked at that, though, we were really surprised to see that that wasn't the case. So at this time point, when we see a difference in size, it's not that we see already the formation of neurons, CX, or the intermediate progenitor types that, that are also then neurogenic, um, which is marked here by TBR2. But we do see them both coming on just fine uh, 10 days later. So that doesn't seem to be the explanation. However, um, we thought a little bit more about, you know, how this tissue architecture could be influenced. And, and we thought we'd look then at cell shape, because of course, if the cells have a different shape, that would influence the tissue. So we looked at cell shape by doing sparse labeling for GFP. And uh, we uh, found that before the size difference, these cells look very similar. They're very fat. Um, and they, they, they have a large apical surface. And we can also see that by uh, staining for one again. Um, and looking at this on FOSS, and we can we can actually trace out each of these uh, apical um, you know surface areas of each of the cells. Now, as a parent, we can actually see then a difference in cell shape. So the the uh, the non-human ape, the gorilla here that I'm showing you, shows a, a much more thinned out um, apical process compared to brain shape. And this you can I think especially see when we look at the ZO1 staining. It's much uh, smaller in the gorilla than in the human. But by day 10 and day 15, they seem to be quite similar. Both uh, cell, in both species, the cells have thinned out. And by day 15, they're making plenty of neurogenic uh, T. So this is just a quantification of the ZO1, again, showing you that um, at particularly day five, we can see that the gorilla have really uh, um, changed their shape pretty dramatically, whereas the human is only just starting to change its shape. Um, and so this suggest this, this particular model, which is that in both humans and non-humans apes, we first have these neuroepithelial cells expanding symmetrically um, and, and, and showing this very um, sort of fat columnar neuroepithelial. At a certain point, the non-human ape switches and uh, its cell shape and becomes very constricted in the apical surface and much more elongated. Um, now, the human does this as well, but it's a little bit later. Um, and so we've, we've called this uh, transitioning uh, stage, the transitioning neuroepithelial cell stage. Um, and this is, this is really um, quite a novel finding actually, because what we're finding here is that uh, we see changes in cell shape here before any of the other changes that, that happen, you know, when these cells are making the transition to becoming radioglia. So these cells are still neuroepithelial, they're still expressing markers of neuroepithelium, and they're, they're still not making neurons. So they haven't changed their fate and they haven't changed their identity. All they've changed by this point is the cell shape. And so this change in cell shape changes the tissue architecture and would lead to a slightly increased number of progenitors in the human. And so that, that way, once they switch to neurogenesis, there's a larger founder stem cell population in humans. And so such that when they then start making neurons, they make uh, an increased number of neurons. And this is also in really stark contrast to, you know, what we know from rodents, because um, we know that these neuroepithelial cells, when they uh, switch to this neurogenic uh, stage, they, they do involve these changes in cell fate. 
but in rodents, these uh, in cell shape, excuse me, but in rodents, these changes in cell shape happen at the same time as changes in cell fate and cell identity. And so what we're showing is that um, in apes, there's this, this shape change as a precursor for all of those other changes. So I, I think that's really interesting that, that, that shape is such an important part of this transition. So we then obviously wanted to look at the molecular regulators of this and try to understand what's regulating these shape changes. So we did um, RNA-seq at, uh, we did RNA-seq in total from 9,000 organoids at different stages, different species, across different batches. And what we found is actually that um, we could just start to see a difference by day five, which is right when those um, size differences are present, are, are beginning to be present. Those differences are maintained through day 10. By day 15, interestingly, we don't actually see differences, but then again, by day 25, we can see differences between the human and non-human ape. And actually the day 25 is very interesting because that's when neurogenesis has already kicked in. And that fits with previous studies uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that have shown differences in the, in the transcriptome between human and other apes, um, particularly in terms of neuro, neurogenesis um, and neuronal maturation. And that's exactly what we also see at these day 25. But we were more interested in the day five and day 10 because that's when we uh, see these shape changes. And so we looked at dynamics of, different, of the different genes that are involved in these uh, and these differences, and we found that there were quite a lot of genes associated with geo terms related to cell morphogenesis, and that these seem to peak earlier in the gorilla than in the human. We then looked more carefully at the genes contributing to these differences, and we wanted to try to identify factors that could be sort of upstream of all of this, that could be actually regulating all of these uh, shape changes. And so we then focused more on transcription factors. And uh, in particularly, um, we focused in on this transcription factor called ZEB2. And the reason we focused on ZEB2 is for many reasons. One, um, in humans, when it's mutated, it causes a condition that involves microcephaly. Um, secondly, um, there are a number of uh, what are called human accelerated regions in non-coding areas around and within the ZEB2 locus. So these are regions that seem to be under some sort of selective pressure in humans. And then finally, also because ZEB2 is a master regulator of epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and I'll get into why that's important uh, in just a moment. We wanted to just you know, make sure that uh, what we were finding in the RNA-seq was true, so this is just validation by uh, qPCR, um, and we find that gorilla, uh, in the gorilla um, organoids, ZEB2 is peaking earlier than in the human. And so Stefano then um, looked more at ZEB2 in human and, and whether it's actually playing a role in this process and found that, first of all, ZEB2 expression seemed to be highest in these neuroepithelial cells that have not yet transitioned to radioglia or seem to be in the process of transitioning. So these are cells that aren't yet turning on the, the radioglial marker GLAST. And so he then um, tried to knock out ZEB2. We couldn't, unfortunately, obtain any full knockouts. We think it's probably necessary for pluripotency of the stem cells, but we, we could um, get a Z2 HET cells. And what we found was that they seem to show um, differences, particularly in cell-cell junction markers like occludin. And the reason that's important is because of what I just said a minute ago, which is that Z2 is an important regulator of EMT. And it does this by um, down-regulating cell-cell junction uh, uh, proteins like the occludins, and then up-regulating mesenchymal markers like N-cadherin and vimentin. And vimentin is actually at one. And so we think that this transition from neuroepithelium to radioglia is, is, a, is a bit like a partial EMT. You know, you see the cells changing to just the very apical surface. Whereas earlier, when they're still uh, very columnar in shape, these, these uh, cell cell junctions um, extend all the way up to the basal surface. Um, and so when we um, knock out a copy of ZEB2, this transition, this partial EMT, seems to be um, uh, slightly impaired. Um, so we then want to look back at the evolution uh, and the role of ZEB2 in the human ape differences. And to do this, we wanted to play around with ZEB2 levels. So we know that ZEB2 seems to be peaking earlier in gorilla than human. So we thought, what would happen if we took human cells and we forced them to turn on ZEB2 earlier? Um, and so to do this, we developed this um, tightly controlled um, induction strategy where we use a doxycycline to induce Cree, and then the Cree recombines out 
a stock codon upstream of Z2. And when we put doxycycline, uh, we can induce Z2 very nicely here um, in green. And interestingly, um, we noticed right away, even just by the bright field, that uh, these induced human organoids, where the Z2 is now turned on uh, too early, uh, actually look just like the gorilla uh, organoids. And we did sparse labeling here as well. And again, you can see they've already um, constricted and elongated their cell shape. Uh, we also quantified the ZO1 uh, surface area and found that the induced uh, human cells actually look very, very similar to the ape. So what this is telling us is that uh, simply by playing around with Z2 levels, we can actually recapitulate and almost sort of, you know, uh, ape eyes the human organoids and make them look like non-human ape organoids. And so this is our model. We think that there seems to be this um, transitioning neuroepithelial stage in humans and other apes, um, but it seems to be turning on a little bit earlier in ape than it does in human. And this is regulated by Z2, which is regulating both the tight junctions and sort of restrict, restricting them to the apical surface. We also have other data I didn't have time to get into, but with the, where Z2 seems to also regulate factors that are controlling actin uh, constriction as well. So this, this would regulate both you know, the elongation and thinning of these uh, apical processes. And then um, this uh, later transition in human translates to an increased number of, uh, of progenitors, this founder stem cell population, so that once these start making neurons, you end up with overall increased numbers of neurons, overall increased size. Um, and so that's indeed what we see in the organoids, and that's when we think that that has implications for in vivo differences. So with that, I'll just thank everybody that was involved in this. Um, I think I mentioned all the major players with the different stories that I showed, but you can see it was really a, a team effort. And I especially want to thank our collaborators who've been involved in, in these stories. Um, and uh, of course, my funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina, for that great talk. We can now open the session for questions. So participants, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. We can have a direct interaction. Hello. Am I audible? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Oh, uh, hi, Madeline. That was a really good talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I have two questions. Uh, one is about the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you looked at infection in the choroid plexus. Uh, did you also see infection in the ependymal cells that line the ventricle? So we don't, uh, we don't actually know if we have any ependymal cells in there. Um, we haven't seen them in our RNA-seq, but we um, and the thing is the ependymal cells uh, during development, they come very, very late. Actually, they come as sort of the last um, uh, division of, of, the, of the radioglial stem cells. So we don't actually know is, my, is basically my answer. Um, and it's also a bit difficult to tell the difference sometimes between, particularly morphologically, for example, between ependymal cells and choroid plexus epithelial cells. So I think we'd have to actually do some more, um, probably some more RNA-seq would reveal that at later time points. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is uh, is more broad. Uh, it's in terms of uh, using the organoids to check uh, new drugs. So for uh, diseases like uh, neurodegenerative diseases, it's simple enough. Uh, we check whether it, uh, a particular drug can reduce degeneration. But for uh, diseases that have uh, psychiatric symptoms, uh, like